Hey everyone, thanks for checking out the show. My podcasts all have ads. If you find the ads annoying, then consider subscribing to the podcast. With a subscription, you won't hear any ads. Plus, you'll have access to exclusive content only available to subscribers. If you can't afford a subscription, please write to me at admin at colemanhughes.org with a few words explaining why you enjoy the channel and how it benefits you. We'll get back to you after a short period of consideration and we'll offer a subscription free of charge. Thanks again for watching and for all your support. Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Coleman. I just got back from my very first trip to the UK, where I attended a great conference organized by the Equiano Project. I'll have much more to say about that on the next episode. But while I was there, I took the opportunity to record a bunch of podcasts in person with guests that I could only access in the UK. So you'll be noticing a disproportionate number of British guests in the next six or so episodes of the podcast, which I'm sure my British listeners will love. And to my non-UK listeners, I can assure you that all the topics discussed will be of interest to you as well. So my first UK guest is Andrew Gold. Andrew Gold is an ex-BBC journalist and documentary filmmaker who now has an excellent podcast called On the Edge. Andrew focuses on weird and controversial people, for instance, psychopaths, former cult members, exorcists, and so forth. In this episode, we discuss Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's decision to leave the UK and the accusation of racism they leveled at the royal family on the way out. We discuss the Israel-Palestine conflict, We talk about the prospect of immortality and whether it would be desirable. We talk about the psychology of gender identity. We talk about pop music, social bubbles, and much more. I really like this conversation because we dealt with so many seemingly unrelated topics, which is a nice departure from most of my conversations, which just focus on one topic. And I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. So without further ado, Andrew Gold. What do you think about Meghan Markle? Well, I think that, um, you know, obviously there's a perception of her in the public eye, especially in Britain, as narcissist, social climber, um, someone who stirs the pot, creates controversy, draws attention to herself, and, <clears throat> and all the rest. My guess is that many of these things are probably true at some level, but they seem to be true of many of the royals. And so why is she being singled out as the, mm-hmm. as the only one, right? From an American perspective, we don't worship the crown. Obviously, Brits do, and I understand that. <clears throat> but from an American ear, when I hear that an American woman goes over there, joins the family, and you know has her phone taken away and can't schedule a lunch with her friend... I think to myself, what is going on there? It makes it only it only makes sense that she would rebel and that <clears throat> she would sort of try to get her freedom back. Um, but again, that's from the point of view of someone that mm-hmm. doesn't worship the crown to begin with. So mm-hmm. the irrational and and freedom constricting uh, sort of habits and rules seem simply irrational to me. Whereas I assume. For many Brits, they <clears throat> it's part of the the value and the honor and the and and all the rest um, is is all of that would be a worthwhile trade off. So my assumption about Megan has been probably yet yeah, maybe some of the unlikable qualities about her may be true, but at the same time, if I were in that situation, I, w- I would have wanted out in a similar way. And in some ways, I blame Harry for maybe not preparing her mm. um, a- as an American. Like, you know, like, <clears throat> did he take her aside and say, look, you're in love with me. I'm in love with you. We want to get married. But you have to understand, this is going to change your life. And it's going to be worse than you think it is. Are you really prepared for this? Yeah. Did he take her aside and say that? Or did he just say, you know what? Mom's going to love you. <laughs> And blindside her with all the... I mean, there was something in his book about how she... Uh, I just read the wiki, wiki summary. How she didn't really know how to curtsy when she mm-hmm. met the queen. Right? If that's any signal of how prepared Harry uh, mm. made her, 
then I blame him at some level for not uh, for for setting her up to fail. Yeah. You know what's not spoken about enough, I think, is um, so much of, of how you feel about them, I suppose, has to comes down to her as, assumptions about how she actually felt and what her ambition was. Because if you believe that she married him to sort of marry up and to get the fame and the, the value of being part of the royal family, then it's hard to feel sympathy for her. If she actually just met this Harry fella and fell in love with him, and now she has to deal with all of this, it's a totally different story. And I think, I guess the people who don't like her think that it's the former, and the people who like her say it's the latter. Which do you think it is? I think it's the... I think it's not really fair for me to say, but I think it's the former. That she married for the status. I think so. She talks in her episode, her podcast episode with Serena Williams about ambition. And she keeps saying, like, why do people hate ambitious women? They hate ambitious women. Look at us. We're so ambitious. And she kept putting herself on a par with Serena Williams, who's one of the most respected, incredible people that, you mm -hmm. know, in terms of her, her athletic ability and how hard she worked and her triumphs and stuff. She's unparalleled. And there are a few people in sports, in any sport, that are totally unparalleled to that extent, like yeah. her. You right. could talk about Messi, the footballer or whatever, but then there's Ronaldo and people like that. There's always, like, one Federer, then there's also Nadal, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, Serena is just, like, a part. And I just thought, how it just felt, but I already had this bias, you know, but mm -hmm. it just felt a little bit like the arrogance to put yourself on the same level as Serena. And mm -hmm. I thought, I want you, Megan, to tell us, okay, but what is your ambition? I want you to lay it out for us. What What is ambitious about you and what is it that people don't like in your ambition? Is that marrying into the crown? Is that an ambition? And mm -hmm. I think that's, a, people can have that ambition. You can want to marry up. People do that. I don't have a problem with that. But I think the problem is then hearing about doing it and then not wanting to do the duties that come with that, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So on the one hand, she was a quite successful actress, very much on the way up. Potentially. I Potentially, but mm -hmm. I mean, I would have bet on her horse very much hmm. from having watched the show Suits. Oh, did you watch beginning. it? Oh, yeah. Okay. Was, <clears throat> it was it good? Great show. It was, it was great. And it was... Mm -hmm. um, it was both popular and beloved and her character in particular, I think in another world, she would have, she would have some room to grow as an actress. She would have been a winning racehorse, mm -hmm. you know, in that world. I'm, I'm quite certain, which undermines the idea that it was just about ambition. On the other hand, being a C-list TV actor is nowhere near being in the crowd. So it, it it, it was quite a jump for her. It was a massive jump for her. There's mm. no understating that. And there's also, um, it's also very possible that the the dream of being a princess essentially um, was part of the attraction to Harry. That's the thing about it is, is, you know, to what extent are status and romance kind of linked in subconscious ways to begin with, right? Is there a clean distinction, a clean line you can draw between loving someone for precisely who they are mm -hmm. and loving them for their status? I wonder about that. Yeah, um, money, stuff like that. <clears throat> ambition. You see like your girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever is ambitious. <coughs> it's uh, it's exciting about them, right? Maybe mm -hmm. if they're rich, that's exciting. And, and mm -hmm. people can, like, that's what I was saying. People can marry up or they can marry for money and I don't have a problem with it. It just feels like if you're going to marry into this institution, you, you've got to do, as you were alluding to, your homework. Mm -hmm. And just a bit of homework, you'd have seen how Diana, who was another person who didn't really fit with the royals, how she was treated, which which wasn't very well. Mm -hmm. But I sort of have this, I do have some sympathy for her. And I have the same sympathy I suppose I would have for maybe a supermodel who uh, is now talking about uh, exposing the industry because everybody wants you to be skinny. And that, you know, all the messages she's getting about you should be skinnier and that kind of thing. And I, I do have sympathy for that. But I also feel like you, you did sort of get into a very superficial industry. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I guess, part of it. Most of us don't even have the looks to be supermodels. With Megan's case, most of us don't have the access to a prince or a princess, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where I find How much it, blame yeah. do you place on Harry? A lot as well. I think you make a really good point that he clearly didn't prepare her enough. <clears throat> um, I think he's not very smart. Prince mm -hmm. Harry. I'm not a royalist. I'm also not anti-royal. I grew up being anti-royal, I think. And then I started to see them more like the Kardashians that they are. Mm -hmm. They don't have any real power. I don't know the stats around how Brits feel. Anecdotally, I could say that I think Australians and Canadians are even more into the 
royal family than us. It's like the first mm. thing they ask about. And I grew up knowing relatively little about them. And then you get to The Crown came out, the TV series, and the whole Meghan stuff, obviously Diana as well. And it, be- it became this huge thing. Mm-hmm. Um, he really doesn't seem very smart. I've read mm-hmm. uh, his book, mm-hmm. and I know it's ghostwritten, and you can tell. Um, and he seems like he's hearing a lot of um, progressive stuff, maybe ideas that we, we know of from woke culture. He talks a lot about unconscious bias. He, there's yeah. a lot of catchphrases he comes out with. And it feels like it's the first time he's heard them. And he's, he's sort of telling the rest of us about this amazing thing he's heard about. And the rest of us are like, well, we've known about this for years, man. Like, we've been living in the real world, working jobs, paying yeah. bills. You've been sat there, not having the best life. I don't, I'm not saying, like, he has the best life. But I think if you are... To finish my point here, I think I would just say that the royals are in a really difficult position right now because they're trying to get modern sometimes. I mean, William said a few things as well. They talk about mental health and these kinds of things. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're, they're very, you know, noble um, aspirations and whatever. Um, they're in a bit of a bind, though, because it feels a little bit like the Tsar in Russia, like appealing to the Bolsheviks. They're trying to appeal to sort of the left. Mm-hmm. And that's great. And the left will like them more. But ultimately, the idea of a monarchy in, on the left doesn't hold up. So I don't know where they can go. I wonder if the left will like them more though, because sometimes if you make a concession to people that are fundamentally against you, it mm-hmm. actually backfires and they, they ask for more. Like is yeah. the, the modern, the monarchy and the Royals, they can't by definition be modern. Mm-hmm. They are a symbol of the old. And that's, I think where their power lies because we, I mean, humans have this tendency, you could even call it a bias, uh, to worship the old. The older something is, the more legitimate it is. It's why we laugh at the Book of Mormon, but not at the Bible. Yeah. Right? Um, it's just time. Interesting. Um, and and the, the royals have that as their main source, I think, of legitimacy is how long they've been around, the unbroken chain of succession. And, um, and so... You know, I wonder how wise it is for them to try to modernize, to try to, you know, I I just, I'm not sure they can do it well because they're so clearly out of touch. And that's not a criticism. It's anyone, if I were a royal, I'd be very out of touch. You can't not be. Yeah. By definition, part of your purpose is to be out of touch. Um, But when Harry says these things, when he talks about unconscious bias and and so forth, um, it is quite clear that he's out of out of his depth and you know one part one thing he did that I felt quite wrong to me was in the Oprah interview and I think maybe again in, in a later interview he accuses an unnamed member of his family of sort of wondering about what the skin color of the baby would be how mm-hmm. dark the baby would be now this to me the way he went about this was so suspicious to me. Um, I mean, if, if you think about this, for uh, one of two things is true. Either someone in the royal family made a truly heinous racist comment about not wanting the baby to be too dark, or someone in the royal family just made a very innocent comment wondering what the, what the mixture of them would look like which is something everyone who's ever had a baby has wondered about their forthcoming baby. You know, yeah. how, how are these two different people going to blend into this new life? So it's either a totally racist comment or a totally innocent comment. Now, if it was a totally racist comment, then he, he did a bad thing by casting that uh, accusation at the whole family and and just letting the public's mind, imagination wa- wonder and go wild about who it could be rather than really holding the individual responsible who said that racist thing. Yeah. Or simply not saying it at all because you don't want to air your family's dirty laundry like that. Like either don't say it or name the specific person that said that heinous thing so that we know who in the royal family is really a hardened enough racist to not want a a, a baby to be as certainly light skinned black as that baby is likely to be, given that Megan is not very dark skinned to begin with, right? You have mm-hmm. to be a real hard and racist to worry that that baby is going to be too dark, right? So either that's the case, or it was a totally innocent comment, in which case he also did a, a very bad thing by making the accusation vague enough 
by basically playing it up and playing this card where it really was just maybe intended as totally innocent comment um, and then casting that accusation of racism at the whole family, it was very fishy. Yeah. Now, if he, if he had said, this person said this and quoted them, said, this person said, I don't want the baby to be too dark, then I respect that because um, it, it would be a horrible comment. But the way he went about it in this strategic, vague way is very suspicious and makes me think that the whole story is BS or um, a, a kind of spin so as to have something to throw at them mm. when they throw at him that he's a traitor and an attention seeker. If he can make them racist, then he is uh, he's not the aggressor, he's the victim. Would you be offended if somebody asked you about your child, what skin color they might be? No, no. I mean, so again, if they were saying, oh God, I hope your baby isn't too dark. Yeah. I'd be like, yeah, fuck off. I'm never talking to you again. Even, I mean, even a racist would know not to say that to Harry, presumably. I mean, I, I'm making assumptions here again, but you'd think like, yeah. gosh, I hope, you know, that doesn't, it doesn't add up. It, it, I mean, it does happen. Of course, there are racists who say things, but right. to him, why would they? But if, you know, you know if, if someone just wondered, oh, well, what is the mixture of me and my girl, girlfriend or my wife mm -hmm. going to look like? Yeah. If we were of two different races, that would be, I'm sure it'd be something that we had talked about. Maybe it's over the line yeah. to, to say it, but it's not racist, right? Sure. So you ha he, he was vague. He was, he had a studied, prepared kind of vagueness about the accusation which was the most wrong thing about it. If you were going to accuse someone of being a pedophile, right? Yeah. You would not say, "Oh, you know, someone in my family talked about liking kids." Yeah. You'd be like, "Hold on. Hold on a second. Be very specific with what you're saying. Name the person and say exactly how they said it. Did they say, "Oh, the the that kid from Stranger Things is cute." <laughs> like in an innocent way, or did they say, "I'm sexually attracted," you know. Yeah. So you yeah. have to. You're careful it, not to say the full thing there. Cause yeah, because someone's going to cut that up. Coleman Hughes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So if you're going to make an accusation, yeah. you you real an accusation of something that serious, you have to be specific with it. And his lack of specificity, mm. to me, was a big red flag about his character and his motivation in sort of going on the whole PR, mm -hmm. uh, you know, campaign that he's on. One of the reasons you enjoy my podcast is because you get the information you might get from a nonfiction book in way less time. Blinkist is a great resource to solve that problem. The Blinkist app enables you to understand the most important points made in a book or podcast in just 15 minutes. Blinkist has thousands of books and podcasts in 27 different categories. So whether you want to be a better parent, smarter communicator, or a more impactful team member, savvier investor, Blinkist can help. With the help of Blinkist, you can discover new perspectives, broaden your horizons, and have more exciting and interesting conversations. My dad, for example, loves Blinkist, and he often introduces me to books I hadn't heard of or potential podcast guests from books he consumed through Blinkist. Plus, Blinkist has a new feature called Blinkist Connect, which allows every Blinkist premium plan to be shared by two different accounts with no additional cost. That means you can invite someone else to join your plan. And if they accept your invitation, the owner of that second account will get complete premium access to Blinkist. Get 25% off Blinkist Premium and enjoy two memberships for the price of one. Start your seven-day free trial by clicking the link in the description box. Yeah, yeah. I do have, a, I do have sympathy for him. Uh, I think sometimes we can be guilty, all of us, particularly me, actually, uh, of, of being too black or white, or, you know, excuse me, because that's what we're talking about, the, the, the pun, I suppose, but too divisive. Like You either hate someone, you love them. And he had a really difficult upbringing, not compared to people who can't pay their bills, of course, but uh, his, his mum died when he was, I think, 12, mm -hmm. uh, got no love from his father, grandparents, um, was sort of, he speaks of the way he was expected, like at the, his mother's funeral to sort of wave at the press and things like that. And he was very much like his book says, brought up as a spare. There's even a reference to sort of the assumption that if, if William needed a kidney or something, he was, he was the one to give it. Um, mm -hmm. William and, uh, 
and Prince Charles at the time, you know, they couldn't share a flight together, but no one minded which flight Harry went on. Mm-hmm. And that kind of thing will get you because you, you can only compare to the environment that you're in. So I, I wonder if what's happening is he's thinking, this has not been fair to me. We, and we've seen this in literature and things like over and over, the one who feels spurned, you get it a lot in Shakespeare kind of thing. You're like spurned, mm-hmm. you don't. Uh, and, and so he, it feels like he want, he's like, right, I'm done with this. I'm, I'm out. Mm-hmm. I think, I don't know how much money he had, but I've heard it might be like he would have had 10 million pounds or something like that, right? Which is a bit more in dollars. Um, by doing all this, he got $100 million for the Netflix documentary. He got 20 million at least for the book. And I'm not sure how much they got for the Spotify series. Mm-hmm. And I guess that's enough to live on. That's enough for them to go, okay, we, we made it. So it might yeah. be that they go off right off into the sunshine now. I doubt it because they're ambitious and they want to be in the media and stuff. But that mm-hmm. I would understand why they would want to do that, you know? What is Harry's ambition? To have enough money to live on independently of his family, perhaps. I don't think of that as ambitious. Mm, no, but it's. But I suppose it's an ambition outside of um, what he would have had, which is just sit there yeah. and be the spare. Right. No, I, 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 I totally get that. I think, um, I mean, it, it was clearly extremely frustrating and unlucky of him to be born into to be born constantly compared to the brother, Mm -hmm. uh, which is at some level something everyone deals with, but it is magnified when you're in the public spotlight and there is such a big difference between the firstborn and the secondborn. In a sense that one is literally going to be king and one is is not. That's That's a psychological complex that could screw with anyone. Um, at the same time, I, I do wonder if, you know, by adulthood, you are, you are supposed to begin to take responsibility for your own mental health and stop blaming others mm-hmm. and try to become a well-adjusted and non-bitter human being. And I'm not saying that he is. Uh, I again I haven't read them. He is. <laughs> He's okay. very bitter. Yeah. He's very defensive. Any interview, any interview you see when people, I, I feel like one of the reasons he's gone to America is because he's getting a bit of an easier time there mm-hmm. in the UK. They're pushing him probably because of what you said, it is a bit more pro Royal or I don't know what yeah. he's getting a hard time from people. And he's like, he's pouncing before the questions even been asked whenever anyone's shed any doubt on his story. Yeah, yeah. But we know that feeling, you know, that feeling, right. When you're, when you're defensive, particularly when it involves yeah, sure. your, your wife or girlfriend or whatever it might be. I mean, I, I'm, I don't have like an aggressive bone in my body, but I remember like the only time I got like close to being aggressive, I was playing soccer, like a mixed game with my, my girlfriend and we all played together in like mm-hmm. Argentina and this guy was being too rough, like, because it was a mixed game. It was just supposed to be fun. And he was like pushing me a lot and he was pushing her and I lost my temper. Yeah. And I remember I went up and I went, and I pushed him like, and he didn't move. He was like much stronger than me. So uh-huh. I went, Rah! and he just like was completely still, which is very embarrassing for me because I'd been like in front of my new girlfriend at the time. Yikes. But it's so different. Like when, you, you know, there is that sort of um, testosterone comes out, the teeth start to bear. And he's oh. getting that from like the world he feels are having a go at his girlfriend and mm-hmm. that they're being uh, racist. Right. I mean, I, I totally get that. And I think Americans, I, mean, I don't think we care that much about Harry. I don't think, my perception is we're neither pro nor anti. And probably, like I said, there is an you know, th- there's definitely a level of sympathy for the racism accusation in America. Mm. I was talking to a, um, a a black British friend the other day, and the point she made is that in Britain, uh, Megan's light skin color among many black people would disqualify her from owning the black identity, right? Many would say, you are too light skinned. You do not actually know what it's like to be black and to be dark. And you should not go around playing the race card like you do. Now, in America, black people would not have that attitude. Despite Megan being very light-skinned, no one would have a problem. Very few would have a problem identifying her as black and allowing her to identify as a black woman and so forth. And that just has to do with the different ways that race has evolved in in both countries. The social history of where that boundary has been drawn. Hmm. It's totally contingent. What do you think that is? Well, in America, uh, there has been intermixing between blacks and whites for hundreds of years since slavery. So there have 
for a very long time, there have been millions of people that are Meghan Markle's skin complexion who were for, you know, up until 1964 categorized as black, um, many of whom were categorized as black and therefore subject to right. second class citizenship. So we have a long history of seeing lighter skinned people as black, um, as just as black as darker skinned people. Whereas the UK doesn't have that mm -hmm. history. The UK has more recent immigration um, from the Caribbean and from West Africa and a smaller population and therefore fewer mixed race people and also no history of a formalized apartheid system where lighter skinned black people were legally and socially right. black. So it, it makes more sense to to not necessarily accept that a mixed person is black, whereas that's the inertia of American social history. Mm. It's so complex, isn't it? Because I, I didn't know she even had uh, any uh, minority status at all for the first like two, three years mm -hmm. uh, until the accusations came out. And most people I've spoken to have said the same thing. It appears the press did know, and that's where it gets murky because the accusations against the press still stand. It doesn't matter. The rest of us didn't realize. I thought she could have looked, you know, I grew up with a lot of Jewish people. She could look Jewish to me. Right. She could look uh, Latina to mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. uh, I, but I just didn't even care. Yeah. But obviously the royal family is this institution of very white, it's the Church of England, it's religious white group, mm -hmm. uh, the firm they call it. And it's, it's. I think it's a little bit cult-like as well. Mm -hmm. So to, it's it's not beyond the realms of possibility that there was some level of racism coming from either them or or the press. Do you think actually that it was? Mm. I mean, if you make the comparison with Diana's treatment, who is as white as it gets, um, and is the closest comparison case, do you think that racism was involved in that? In, so in Meghan Markle's? I think there's two possible, there's two possible um, routes we can go down. So one is that racism was part of the cause of some of the hatred towards her. And some is that there's hatred towards her because she is somebody going into the royal family and not wanting to do the duties like Kate does, and just like Diana did. And that some, a small percentage of people in the media have said things that are a little bit racist. So it wasn't the cause of it, of the hatred or whatever, but they've there has been some racist some racism in the articles written about them. My guess is that if it were not Meghan Markle, but an analogous white C-list actress that came in a bit clueless about the crown and had the same kind of infights, yeah. that probably 90% of the hostility would have been the same. Yeah. So it's just that tiny extra percent. And there are, there are racist Perhaps, people, yeah. you know, because I think you and I have both spoken a lot against some of the progressive movement. We call it woke, but you're not supposed to call it woke anymore because it's sort of simplifying the whole thing. Uh, and this accusation of um, just like everything's racist, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I went maybe quite far with that. And I'm starting to have not second thoughts as such because I still feel that way, but I've gone on a few more podcasts that are a little bit to the right. Mm -hmm. And I've seen some of the comments and the mm -hmm. chat just because I'm Jewish. And I don't even know how they know half the time. Mm. And you come back from like, so so Tim Paul is quite, he's, he's even like center, right? I don't even think he's that far or anything. You come back and you look at the comments and every other one is, Jew, Jew, he's a J word, he's a this, he's a that. Yeah. And I think, oh, okay, there, there are a lot. It's, and even if it's only 1% of the world, right? Mm -hmm. like, or 1% of America, it's still what, three and a half million people who, who would do that to uh, whether a Jewish person, a Latino person, a black person, whatever, you know? Yeah. No, it, it is definitely a big problem. I don't know if I would call Tim Pool center right at this point. I think he's yeah, maybe. drifted and, and there may be, in my view, an audience capture phenomenon there because the kinds of topics he was dealing with five years ago compared to now Mm. seem to have narrowed down to topics that only the right likes. Yeah. That Whereas happens. he used to have, yeah, that's, a, I mean, that's a problem that all of us content creators can face. Yeah. And some deal with it differently than others. Some go f completely, they get sucked fully into the, the beam of attention yeah. and so forth. And others manage not to as much. Um, yeah. I made 50 videos about Tom Cruise. 50. 50? Yeah, I think 50. Or, or related to, to Scientology. So maybe 20 of those wow. were about Tom Cruise because they just did so well. Yeah. And they brought in subscribers. Yeah. And people liked it. And then you get people in the comments saying, like, you're obsessed with Tom Cruise. I'm like, no, you are. You're, you guys are obsessed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're obsessed with Tom Cruise. You're obsessed with Meghan Markle. Maybe we are. Maybe yeah. we're not. But like, you know, 
I, I remember when I used to work at um, my first ever job, I was 21. I worked at HarperCollins uh, Book Publishers and I was a bit snobby at that age, just out of university, had done my English literature degree. So I was all into that stuff. And um, I was really upset to learn that some of these really nice books that I liked were actually losing money. And this one that was Justin Bieber, who had, like, it was a picture book of like, mm-hmm. Justin, here's Justin with a motorcycle. Mm-hmm. Here's Justin doing something else. And that was like the biggest seller of all time, times 20 for HarperCollins. Mm-hmm. It was like killing it. it. It smashed like Tolkien and the Lord of the Rings, all that stuff. It just went way past that. And I was, cause I was quite snobbish and, you know, new and out of school, just, I was like really upset. And I remember speaking to my boss and saying, what's, what's the deal with this? How can we do? And she said like, look, you got to forget that because that stuff is what allows us to print the really nice stuff. Right. You've got to do it. So I just said to myself, right, I, I'm going to keep doing all the interesting, weird, culty things and the the psychological stuff. But, you know, Tom Cruise. And- to me, the Bieber paradox is the best example of, of how thick all of our bubbles are, mm. right? The most popular artist in the world, and I've never met a single fan. <laughs> so what does that say? That, what that says is the set of people I meet in day-to-day life is yeah. highly non-random, yeah. highly selected based on who I am, what I like. I love and, that. and I don't, I think it was Slate Star Codex, Scott Alexander, who, who had this analogy that we are all basically living in dark matter worlds where it's like, we're all in the universe, but dark matter is like, it's all there, but you just can't see it. Yeah. Um, that's what it, that's what it's like to be in the world. It's like, we're all in these very thick social bubbles. I meet people all the time on the street who, you know, are, are a fan of me. And to them, I'm a famous person, right? And they think that I'm getting mobbed on the street all day long, but no, I'm just famous in your bubble, yeah. right? Like I, I'm not a famous person. I, I could, you know, I, I set this up misleadingly because I don't get stopped all the time, right? But when I do, people assume that I get stopped all the time. Yeah, of course. Um, which I've is never been totally stopped. not true, right? I've never been stopped ever. But there are certain, you know, if you were to get in a room with your hardcore podcast mm. fan base, many of them would assume that you are 10 times more famous than you are. Yeah. Because we all forget to correct for our bubbles. That's true. I get I get email and I reply and I try and it's getting harder, of course, but I try and reply as much as possible. Yeah. And then people reply to that saying, this must be a bot or an assistant writing for you. This can't right. be the Andrew. Go- like, what are you talking? What are you, yeah. you know, it, but you're right. It's a, it's a complete bubble thing. Um, I find that, I mean, I was just watching Elvis last night, the the movie, and mm-hmm. I thought exactly what you just said about Justin Bieber. Of course, it's a little bit different, but I, I said, I don't think I've ever met someone who I'm like, hey, what are you listening to? And they're like, just just some Elvis. Whereas Frank Sinatra, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Beatles, Rolling Stones. Me too. Stuff from that, classical music, Tchaikovsky, mm-hmm. fine. I've never heard someone listen to Elvis. Mm-hmm. You never heard someone listen to Elvis? Never. What the fuck? <laughs> there may be something else going on there too. We get like three swears now. Okay, from what is it, every twenty minutes, set the clock again. <laughs> um, so, I mean, that I'm very ignorant about Elvis's music, so what I'm going to say might be very ignorant. But there may be some element of that, uh, which is that Elvis's music may not have aged as well as the mm. Beatles and Sinatra. Yeah, I think there is a big dynamic in music and art, which is that. What uh, I mean, I call this the flow rider effect, right? That song, Low. Mm. Do you remember that song? Low, 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 low. low, low. We should just do this. Muggy, sweat, <laughs> pants. Yeah. So, like, that's, that, that yeah. song, when I was about 10 years old, felt like it was number one for like two years. <laughs> yeah. And I'm only exaggerating a little bit. If you actually look at the chart, it was number one for like wow. a year. Yeah. No one gives a fuck about it now. No one gives a fuck about Flow Rider. Um, and yet, there are so- there are Beatles songs. There are you know Michael Jackson is a perfect example, right? Mm-hmm. You show a five year old Michael Jackson today, odds are they're going to love it. If you show Michael Jackson a five year old, make He'll sure it's love that way it even around. more. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry everyone. <laughs> yes, Michael Jackson's. You're right. That's last. So thing. yeah, there's you can't always tell in the moment which music is timeless and which music is attractive because of a cultural moment that's going to change. Mm. Some some music appeals to human nature mainly to quote a michael jackson song <laughs> and others appeal appeal to cultural fads and trends yeah. that once they fade look very strange in hindsight 
there are some Elvis fans listening to this who are We're going to disagree. I know. They're going, the, the, what do you mean? Hound dogs are beautiful. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. And I actually could be wrong. My general point still stands, even if Elvis may, is right. not an example. You know, you know what's an interesting one is uh, Robbie Williams. Have you heard of Robbie Williams? Mm. Exactly. So Robbie Williams, and again, people are you know, always disagreeing or whatever, listening. I can imagine them all shouting in their cars. What are you talking about? Is probably, he's the most famous pop star on the planet. And you've never heard of currently? him. Currently? Possibly currently, but definitely 10 years ago. Okay. Right? Dash, no? Robbie Williams? I know. You were in Australia, right? So you know one of the biggest pop stars in the world? Yeah. Okay. Americans, no one's heard of him. No. But I'm not, I'm not saying like it was a British sensation. Uh-huh. I'm saying like Argentina, anywhere mm-hmm. I've lived, Colombia. Mm-hmm. You could go to like, I don't even know, like the depths of some obscure place. Mm-hmm. And he is like... Like Madonna times 10 in terms of how famous Justin Bieber levels. Right. Nobody in the entirety of America, and I think probably Canada, has heard of him. Mm-hmm. The strangest thing ever. Yeah. What's going on? Social bubbles. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what it is if it's like his name was too similar to Robin Williams. Yeah, I mean, that's the first thing I thought of. Yeah. I asked, I got to interview Robbie a few for this podcast. Mm. Biggest moment of my life. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I cannot, because I grew up as a fan, you know, he was my Justin Bieber, you know, when I was 15. Right. Uh, and I liked all the high, you know, the more, the, the, the radio heads and all those kinds of things. But I was just like, I went through a phase of being um, proudly populist and I just loved him. Mm-hmm. And it was just, I, over the years I came to learn, like no one in America knows who that guy, apart from people with like Latino parents and lineage and stuff like that sometimes have, because mm-hmm. he's so big in, in other <clears throat> South America and Central America. But uh, I had him on, I was so excited, but most of my audience are American. So mm-hmm. everyone was just like, oh, another episode. Right. And I wanted to be like, no, this is like my thing with like, you know, much more famous than Justin Timberlake, but Justin Timberlake guy. And yeah, no one cared. You should have titled, titled it more famous than Justin Timberlake. <laughs> that probably would have offended him, but Americans would have clicked. He's had like more number one albums in the UK than, he's had the most ever. And like some more than um, the Beatles, more than Elvis, yeah. um, the Rolling Stones, like mad, but a pop star. Yeah, I mean, Americans, we tend, because we know we're the hub of entertainment for the world, we don't really pay attention to too much that comes from the rest of the world. I mean, it has to be incredible and incredibly branded to really break through in America. Spice Girls worked. Mm -hmm. Parasite. That was, yeah, that movie was really, really good. I'm thinking of British bands that make it in America. I think there are quite a few, though, aren't there? Yeah, there are. Loads of them, but just Robbie didn't for whatever reason. That's my nickname. But even the British bands that made it in America, they they almost sing with an American accent or an accent that is is not identifiably British. Like, there's a lot of British bands you wouldn't know they're British from from the accent. Yeah, that's, that's right? something that they that's, sing with. Yeah, that's, that's like... A, Certainly you'd never know Adele was British. That's called something. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but it's like... Well, firstly, there's that transatlantic accent. You know that one that doesn't exist. Do you know that accent... In the, it's in the movies yeah, in like yeah. the 1940s. Like. Ah, what do you mean? <laughs> hey, you're talking to me, fella. Yeah. <laughs> My name's George Bailey. George Bailey, you say. Why? <laughs> Why? That's an interesting name. Yeah. And obviously, yeah, no one spoke that way. And I think there's something to that in, in music as well. Mm-hmm. It's somewhere in between the two sometimes, when, especially when English people are singing. Uh, and we, I think I, you know, I like to sing a little bit. And I mm-hmm. used to sing uh, a little bit American as well. Yeah. And then we go through like a phase when you're 17 where you're like anti that and you, mm-hmm. you sing really British. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I don't know if you've, have you heard, I mean, the Arctic Monkeys? Yeah, they they sing not just in because it's it almost becomes like you almost like so it starts being a bit nationalistic almost. So you have got Lily Allen, do you know Lily Allen? She's, yeah. So she yeah. sings very English as well. But then they're even the Arctic Monkeys are singing regional. They're from Sheffield. Yeah, and, and so, well, well, when people sing English, they don't sing posh English, right? They, they tend s- not to. No, because that's not, not cool. To. Is yeah, it? It's not cool. Yeah. Well, hello. I'm having. Yeah. <laughs> there must be someone. There must be some. There must I'm be some sure people we're not are. thinking of who are like they sing really posh. Yeah. But the Beatles, you, you, I don't think you'd. All, uh, sometimes they would sort of talk, sing, mm-hmm. and you heard the Scouse yeah. accent, uh, yeah. Liverpool accent. Uh, the Beatles is that kind of thing would come yeah. out. But uh, Arctic Monkeys really do that. That Sheffield. Mm-hmm. I bet that you look good on the dance floor. That, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, what do you think of Trevor Noah? Um. You know, I haven't followed his work in a long time. I did his podcast years ago oh. and um, argued against reparations. Okay. And uh, I, I don't, you know, I, I'd love to go back and listen to that. I don't know. <laughs> I, I think he's, you know, he's pretty funny. He's pretty smart. And um, I don't know. What's, what, what, why do you bring him up? I'm he's curious. made like headlines around here at the moment because he said that Britain is a racist country. 
oh. uh, about the whole Megan. As opposed to all the other countries. Yeah, which are I not. think so. He seems to be focusing on it. He's from South Africa, man. You know, like, <clears throat> uh-huh. like wow. It, it gets people's back up, backs up a bit. And he's, he, oh, he said that, like, he said stuff about Megan, but also about um, Rishi Sunak, who's the prime minister at the moment. Mm-hmm. He's of Indian or Asian heritage. I'm not sure exactly where, actually. Um, and he said, oh, I don't know. It just frustrates me because he put out like a thing saying like, oh, look at the backlash to this. It shows that we're still living in a racist society. And I've not, there hasn't been any backlash. I think as far as I know, I, mm-hmm. I don't think it's, but this is a problem on both sides of sort of cherry picking the tiniest right. things. Um, but yeah, that's Trevor Noah for you. When you give to charity, how much impact will your donation actually have? This question can be hard, if not impossible to answer. Most charities can't tell you how your money will be used or how much good it will accomplish. You may know it could theoretically help a cause, but how? Or more importantly, how much? If you want to help people living in poverty with evidence-backed, high-impact charities, I recommend you check out GiveWell. GiveWell spends over 30,000 hours each year researching charitable organizations and only directs funding to a few of the highest-impact, evidence-backed opportunities they've found. Over 100,000 donors have used GiveWell to donate more than $1 billion. Rigorous evidence suggests that these donations will save over 150,000 lives and improve the lives of millions more. And using GiveWell's research is free. GiveWell wants as many donors as possible to make informed decisions about high-impact giving. They publish all of their research and recommendations on their site for free, no sign-up required. They allocate your tax-deductible donation to the charity or fund you choose without taking a cut. If you've never donated to GiveWell's recommended charities before, you can have your donation matched up to $100 as long as matching funds last. To claim your match, go to givewell.org, pick podcast, and enter Conversations with Coleman at checkout. Make sure they know that you heard about GiveWell through Conversations with Coleman to get your donation matched. I mean, the the claim that British, that, that Britain's a racist country, the UK is a racist country, I mean, when people say these things, I think, you know, the only way that that's a meaningful sentence is if you're saying it's more racist than your average country Mm. Um, or especially racist relative to the rest of the world, which to me is nonsense. I mean, if you travel the world, if you study, if you get out of the West, Western centric viewpoint, America, English speaking, Western Europe, Western Europe centric viewpoint and study attitudes towards race in China, in India, in Russia, in South America, in Africa. And you were to try to rank the countries in terms of how racist the average person is, right? And there are some studies that have tried to do this. There's a global values survey about 10 years ago that was published in the Washington Post, which just asked a representative sample of Earth's citizens everywhere. Mm. How'd you feel if a person of a different race moved in next door? Uh. The finding was not that Britain and America were the most racist countries by that metric. The finding was that we're the least. Right. And it makes sense that we are the least because in America's case, um, and in Britain's case, I think we, first of all, there's enlightenment values. There's there is a um, a goal of treating people as individuals, even though it's not always lived up to. In many places in the world, that goal does not even exist. Mm. That value, the value that makes you a hypocrite when racism does surface, doesn't exist, right? There's no hypocrisy to be had because there's no goal culturally or politically to not be racist. Bigotry is just so the norm and so accepted in most parts of the world. Um, Whereas in our societies, we have tried and made mistakes along the way to fight it. Mm. Um, And then secondly, you know, we, in America at least, we've dealt with the challenge of trying to be pretty much the first large multi-ethnic democracy with no ethnic definition of what it is to be an American. And most countries throughout history have said what it is to be a citizen of this country 
is to be, is to speak this language and to be of this ethnic group. Mm -hmm. That's so taken for granted. That's what the concept of a nation state is. It's to make a state out of a nation, a people. Wow. Um, America, because of historical circumstances, went a different route, which is this is not a, a state comprised of an ethnicity. This is a state where anyone can be an American. Mm -hmm. And that's a very difficult thing to do because then you get into tensions between people, right? It At some level, it's much easier to say, actually, just we're going to put a fence around my ethnic group. We're going to make it a country and good fences make good neighbors, right? Yeah. That's what borders are. That's the logic of borders. It's why they can help create peace because you're putting a wall between people that would otherwise fight. And sometimes they still do fight, but. Is the, is the UK like the States in that sense? Um, no, not quite. I mean, it, it is now more and more. Mm. Yes. I suppose more technically more, it's yeah. Church of England is the, is the, is the, the head of the States. Right. Um, yeah, the UK is, is, is a different example, but it's not, it's certainly, you know, America has had this goal since the inception. Sure. Um, Israel's an interesting <clears throat> one, isn't it? Cause that's a nation state yeah. and a lot of people anti Israel and I understand that. And then I, I coming from a Jewish family and, and that kind of thing, obviously I've seen over the years, a lot of, uh, anti-Semitism or whatever, you know, like people, everyone has of their own minority or whatever, but it makes me keenly aware that, or, or it gives me a feeling that if Israel weren't there, it could get worse. Things could get bad. They might not. If Israel weren't there, it as a defensive, a deterrent. A deterrent. To... To global anti-Semitism or, or yeah, something to, like to something bad happening. I, yeah. you know, my my sister had to go to a school in in, in England. She went to a Jewish school. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't go to school like that, I, and I don't agree with having segregated schools like that. I don't like that, uh, or, or faith schools. Um, but she did, and it's like the security is like mad, like barbed wire and stuff like that, and mm -hmm. it's like you know. And when she's come out, she's been chased down the streets uh, by people shouting, you Jewish, this and that. And again, it's like, it's it's so rare. It's such a small percentage of society, but it's there. Mm -hmm. But there are definitely problems, particularly like in France, it gets really bad. Mm -hmm. um, and it can, there is a, there's like a conflict between sort of some parts of like the Muslim population and the Jewish population that yeah. can happen sometimes. So in, in France and in, in parts of the Middle East and stuff and where, I don't know, there's a fear and it, it, it might be rooted in nothing, or it might be rooted in a lot of evidence. I don't know, but there's a fear among a lot of Jewish people it could happen again, mm -hmm. uh, that they get sort of grouped up and carry, you know, and there's just a feeling like, no, but that's not going to happen because Israel's there. Well, that was the logic of Israel's creation. Yeah. And it made sense. Uh, the, I mean, the Zionists from the 1880s onward decided that because of the pogroms in Eastern Europe, that no one is going to protect us we, we cannot rely on the world to protect us. We have to protect ourselves. And that's why they founded the state of Israel. And in the wake of the Holocaust, the, the world had quite a bit of well, uh, um, of sympathy for that rationale. I mean, what had just happened is that the world had essentially let Germany genocide the Jews and most countries had, you know, turned away Jewish refugees, right? Like yeah. the world let that happen. So the world could not then turn around and say, actually, no, you guys don't need your own state. Yeah. At that time, it made, it made perfect sense. And uh, Aliyah made perfect sense, right? Like that, the notion that any Jew anywhere in the world that feels unsafe can come here and they will preferentially get citizenship over yeah. people of other ethnic groups. In most situations, that would look like a racist immigration policy, right? In the situation of a group that has just narrowly escaped total annihilation, while the world, you know, um, watched. Did, while the world watched, or did did far too little, uh, too late. That looks like a very sane and understandable policy. Now, does that make does that policy make sense today? I had Benny Morris on my podcast recently, who's an Israeli historian, mm -hmm. um, a preeminent Israeli historian, and uh, a big defender of Israel, and would nevertheless said at this point, Aliyah is not a policy he, he any longer supports because, um, you know, the historical context where it was born is, is no longer true. I mean, mm. yes, there is anti-Semitism in various places, but at the time 
that policy was um, sort of conceived, it was realistic to expect another Holocaust in the short term, right? Like there was no guarantee in 1945 that it wasn't going to happen again in a year, mm. right? We, can, we know with hindsight that it didn't, but there was no prospective guarantee that, you know, a, a resurgent Germany or somewhere else wasn't just going to finish the job. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's complicated as well, I think, because I think you might, one might have a different perspective living in either America or Israel. In Israel, everyone's Jewish and it's sort of, you know, and in America, it's really fascinating as a Jewish person from outside of America. Well, not, not everyone's Jewish. Um, what? In Israel? In oh, yeah, Israel sorry, yeah, yeah. you're yeah. right. Well, 80% or something, I imagine. Yeah. Minus, yeah. yeah no, good 80%, point. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, but, but I mean, like lots of people around you are yeah. and of all social <laughs> strata, says strata, strata, you know, mm -hmm. in, in every level of Jewish people, you know, uh, going to America is great and fascinating. Yeah. As a Jewish person from outside of there, because the, it's sort of really got into the culture in a way that it hasn't done in other countries. What has? Judaism, Jewish oh, culture. Yeah. yeah. Larry David, Woody <laughs> Allen, totally. Jerry Seinfeld. Mm -hmm. people, you hear people who are not even Jewish say, like calling someone a schmuck uh, mm -hmm. and everyone knows what that means mm -hmm. and that is not an experience that those of us from outside of america have ever experienced you know we don't it, people they would know the word schmuck but that's that's about it um and especially outside of london so so i grew up in north london which is where most jewish people grew up but as soon as you move away i, I went up to study in leeds in the north of england and like they've never a lot of them there are jewish people up there of course but a lot of them have never seen a jew before mm -hmm. and people would make jokes when i got to university it was like where are your horns and where are you and all this kind of thing i was like okay okay and you know why oh you, you can't one thing i'll say though mm, that on. is actually the same in america about the rural oh urban. You're right yeah so i grew up in and around new york city i grew up I mean, I think the high school I went to was probably 30% Jewish. Oh, I went to like six bar mitzvahs in seventh grade. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, it, it was in a town called Livingston, and they used to call it Livingstein. Right. That's right, what the right. Jewish kids used to call it. Sure. Um, so I was very familiar with, and I knew all the Jewish holidays. I knew the song. I knew the bar mitzvah songs. I was very, huh. you know, um, it, it seemed very, didn't seem like a strange thing to me. Interesting. But if you go, I mean, there's many Jews, I think Mark Cuban talked about this, who grew up in other places, you know, outside of New York City, which is where the vast majority of American Jews live in and around, um, maybe a little bit in LA, a little bit in sure. Miami. But if, if, if you live anywhere else, it's like you're encountering people that have never met a Jewish person and make all those crazy jokes about the horns right. and the money grubbing, all those, you know, messed up jokes. Um, and at the end of the day, Jews are only 1% of the American population, yeah. maybe two. Less than the UK, less than 1%. Is that right? I think. Yeah, Again, I don't so, want to be wrong on the podcast, but I think so. Yeah. It's weird. So I, and I, I feel like so that's when, I guess a Jewish person living in Israel or New York might feel in some ways a bit sort of safer. And those of us outside, it's just stories about like getting chased and getting shouted. And you think, oh God, thank, thank God. It, it, is, it is a comfort that Israel exists. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that what Israel does is right most of the time. It's government and the, the way they settle, you know, a lot of the stuff they do is awful. Mm -hmm. uh, I just like to explain it because most of, especially on YouTube, but online is like so anti-Zionist. And to be Zionist is like a bad word now. Mm -hmm. And I like to explain just from, I guess, in a, to, so, to sort of play or, or not play on, but... In, what's the word, invoke, inspire some empathy from people. It's like, I'm not saying Israel's great. It's just like, for us, it's like, thank God it's there. And it is a weird thing, like you say, it's a weird, like this nation state, because it is a state that is, I guess, racist in a sense. It is like, mm -hmm. you get preferential treatment if you are Jewish. Yeah. If they were to just like, say, become one state with Palestine and to let um, those people who are not Jewish in, if it became more than 50% not Jewish, then the state wouldn't be a Jewish state anymore. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't vote for Jewish politicians. So that's one of the craziest things going on today in like a non-racist world that we, that we strive for. You've got a country that clearly is, and I sort of defend that. Do you know what I mean? I do. I mean, I, so I think we should acknowledge the fundamental good luck that m our nations live in, which is to say the United States is not surrounded by five or six nations that are not barely historical, kind of sometimes to some degree current enemies that have invaded us multiple times within living memory, mm. um, that we're, we're not facing, I mean, like the history of Israel since its inception has basically been the history of being invaded and attacked. Um, you know, like you, you can 
talk about the the specific start and end dates of each war and each intifada and each, you know, global campaign to, you know, hijack planes with Israelis on them, right? But if you look at a bird's eye view, it's just it's just basically a constant state of deterring th- of of combating threats, right? And and it flares up and it flares down, but it just never goes away. And it's surrounded and it's the size of New Jersey. And so if you ask what is it that has caused Jews in Israel to rally so much around their Jewish identity and to there's no separation of, 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 you know, synagogue and state there. So there are aspects of the government that do privilege and uh, that do privilege Jewish uh, religious, um, you know, practices. We ask, what is it that has caused that? Is it that they are more ethnocentric than, you know, Western European and American states? Or is it the fact that they are besieged and have their attitude towards group identity has been shaped by constant need for group survival. Mm. It's something, I mean, the analogy uh, I think my, my, my friend makes uh, is that, you know, consider how America and Britain to some extent reacted to just two planes Right, hitting our but we invaded and destroyed two countries. Yeah, went on a twenty-year sort of forever war. Um, you know, imagine how we would react if that were just like a yearly occurrence. Right, mm. this is how people react when they are threatened. You know, twenty-four-seven with rocket attacks, with terrorist attacks, with full-blown wars, and. Uh, you know, Israel has managed to defend itself extremely effectively, especially in the last, say, 50 years. Um, but the, you know, the consequences of its successful defense have been global pariah status. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think there's, there's no greater sort of, there's no greater push towards sort of racism and things like that than threat or like I think I saw some study where they got rid of they were able to mute scientists would collect sort of mute your amygdala the the threat sensor in the brain Mm -hmm. Uh, and they did it on people who held racist views Mm -hmm. and while it was being sort of numbed uh, they didn't hold those views anymore about immigration Mm -hmm. and things like that they were much more welcoming and accepting so threat is really that's the thing that it's gets basically yeah. fear by another name. Yeah. I mean, well, let's look at, you know, the, the, the pandemic, the start of it, the way mm-hmm. people, we just lose our humanity. Mm-hmm. We just, and we all do. And this idea, oh, look at those people in that country, how they're behaving. We, you know, when you've got statistics of that, that high, you've got millions of people in a place who are acting one way. It suggests that there's something human about it that we would all, that we would all do. Right. So uh, that, that is my perception of Israel is there's the paradigm of racism that people put on the situation and there's a paradigm of security and self-defense. Mm. I, I don't think that racism is the best way to understand uh, Israeli treatment of Palestinians okay. or, or Israeli treatment of Arabs. I think that we in the West, because we have um, a history of racism, uh, we, we tend to graft that analysis onto situations that are quite different. I don't think that the relationship between Israelis and Palestinians is very similar at all to the situation between black and white Americans historically Mm. or between white South Africans and um, black South Africans. I think what has happened in Israel is, is, is a result of the, you know, constant threat of annihilation since 1947. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well then, so then I can hear people again, like screaming, listening to the podcast yeah. saying, but they stole, they stole the land that wasn't theirs. Mm-hmm. And that reminds me as well of something that you've spoken a lot about, which is reparations mm-hmm. for slavery. Uh, and that, that involves sort of trying to balance things societally based on the past. I mean, where do you, where did you, where have you, where did you stand on that? And, and has that, have, have things changed over the years? Well, I mean, the first thing I, I would, I understand people say they stole the land. Mm. That's not actually true historically. 
the land was purchased, largely purchased first from the Ottoman Empire and then from Arabs during British Mandate Palestine. So it wasn't mm. stolen or, or, I mean, not, not initially. And then land claimed in defensive wars is not quite the same as stealing, I think. Um, but the larger point is that at some point, you know, every border that we take for granted on the map today, almost all of them were ill-gotten mm. in some ways. There were many of them were the result of expansionist wars all over the globe. Um, how did China expand its, its, its borders? How did how did Russia? Uh, I mean, these are these were all bloody empires that expanded their borders via conquest and rape and theft. And this is our, um, this is a history we're trailing as a species. It's only very recently in the history of our species that we have viewed conquest and war as a bad thing. So either we are going to litigate all of history in the court of, of modern public opinion, or we have to have some statute of limitations where, listen, yes, Many generations ago, people did horrible things to each other, but we have to, while acknowledging that and taking it seriously and apologizing for it, all, all of those symbolic gestures, I think, are very important, those symbolic acknowledgments. We cannot be holding people today responsible for the sins of their great, great, great mm. grandparents. It reminds me a little bit of um, the situation we had with the FARC in Colombia and uh, the IRA in Ireland, where they ended up holding a referendum in both those countries. Do we just forget their crimes and, you know, blank slate, and then they'll stop terrorizing us? And I believe I'm right in saying that the IRA, with the IRA, that's what happened to stop it going on. Mm -hmm. In Colombia, um, they, that it didn't go that way. So the FARC con continued uh, because the Colombian people voted not to forgive what they had done. So they continued in, in action. So it's that thing of, do you just wipe a clean slate now and say, let's go on? I suppose what's difficult about that, well, again, I'm just thinking of the other side, the devil's advocate. People are saying, yeah, but because of those things, today there are ramifications, there are consequences. There are people who, there are certain groups who are less well off than other groups because of that history and that needs to be addressed. But I don't know how you'd even go about doing that in any kind of fair way. I don't think there's any scientific or real way to show how slavery affected any individual. Yeah. My ancestors were slaves in America. If I gave you some story about how that affected me, mm. that would be a BS story. Yeah. In other words, it, it would be historical fiction. I don't, no one knows how these things affected you, right? Yeah. Um, but did you have, did you, I, I have no idea, did you have like quite a middle class upbringing? Yeah. So, so, so other people could say, well, maybe not you, but what about, I'm just playing devil's advocate. Well, then what about my dad? What about my grandparents? You know, what mm. determines whether one person if you want to go down that road, you you start getting into very weird hypotheticals. Like, what if I had my ancestors had never been brought as slaves to America, and I grew up instead in Nigeria? Hmm. So, do we want to be going down hypotheticals of who has benefited and who has not benefited from history's crimes? I think, you know, to the way on my dad's side, my ancestors got to America was via slavery. And the long-term result of that is that I was born in America, which is the wealthiest nation and one of the nations with the highest social mobility, the ability to go from poor to rich. Um, so is, is this something we really want to, is, is this a question we want to be pretending we know the, the answers to in any individual's case, you can't really say how these things, um, uh, affected in the long run. And, uh, I, I think it's, I think that people create stories. Um, I mean, people create stories and the truth is that we, we just don't actually know in any individual case. Do you, this thing is the reason I'm poor from 400 years ago. My family, we don't, we don't really know much about beyond my grandparents, I think my great grandparents, uh, they would have been in Eastern Europe and we don't know, just we know there was some vague story passed down about pogroms and things and they they were impoverished and they came to the UK and it took like four generations uh, to sort of have some footing in the mm -hmm. country. 
Um, but we don't know because it gets like wiped. And I'm, I'm fascinated. And I asked my grandpa uh, before he died a few years ago, like, well, what was our name? Because it wasn't gold. And it, even my dad's was, was Goldstein and he changed it to gold because of like the anti-Semitic attacks and stuff. Mm-hmm. But gold is still quite obviously Jewish. Um, but before that, it was some Russian name. Mm-hmm. And we don't know what it was. And I asked my grandpa if he could like remember and he came up with some word and it, I didn't. I asked my dad later. I was like, "Yeah, Grandpa said that was the word. That's what our name was." And he was like, "No, Grandpa's you know doesn't remember it, that. That's a Yiddish word that means idiot, right?" So that was. <laughs> he, he was. I was like, "Right, we're definitely. That's not our name then." So, or maybe it was, you know, because people did used to get named after their profession. So maybe my family were idiots. I don't know. <laughs> but, but yeah, so um, we don't know, and I'd be fascinated to know. Do you know? I'm just. I'm just out of curiosity. Do you know about your your lineage and your your, your people before you? Yeah, my my ancestors in a, in on my dad's side were uh, slaves on Thomas Jefferson's plantation, Monticello. Wow. The gardener was named Wormley Hughes, and he's my six or seven greats grandfather. Huh. And the only reason I know that is because it was Jefferson's plantation. They yeah. kept very close records. Wow. Do you think about about that? Do you, do, do they seem part of you? Um. I suppose you don't I think don't know, six I mean, generations ahead in the future, do yeah. you? <laughs> no, I mean, I'm sure they couldn't have conceived of of me. Nor, I, I don't think about my six generations. Yes, that's it, yeah. <laughs> offspring. Which is a thought, you know? Yeah. And that's something that I, I feel sometimes about climate change. And I, that's just me being really honest mm. uh, because everyone's upset and worried about it. And they're right to be, right? It's, it's, this is bad if climate changes and the world goes away. Mm-hmm. But a selfish part of me is a bit like, okay, well, I want my kids to inherit a nice earth if I have kids and then my grandchildren I can't really conceive of them but of course yeah I just hope they're happy and hey I don't want my grandkids kids to be living in a desert <laughs> but beyond that like does it I don't exist anymore mm-hmm. and so nothing exists <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean well then it, it's hard to be emotionally attached to the world that far in the future yeah but that's where philosophy and uh, ethics, I think, can help you think about what is the right attitude to have because we should care about the long, the long run future. But the Earth's going to die one day anyway. Sure, but maybe by then, will our technology? You know, Elon Musk will be seen as a caveman by the standards of the day, and will be able to colonize a whole other star system. Would you want to live forever? Hmm. In my current twenty-six year old body. In a, in a healthy enough state, yeah. Define healthy enough. Healthier than you are now. No, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, yeah, good. Like, like you're, yeah, why not? 20, you're 26 or whatever, in a robot body that's made good or whatever. Probably yes. What about in a 60-year-old person's body? Ask me when I'm 60. Yeah. I think what happens is you start, you know, that there's that Beatles song, When I'm 64, Will mm-hmm. You Still Feed Me? Da, 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 mm-hmm. When I'm 60. So, uh it's so funny to watch like my, or talk to my dad about that, that kind mm-hmm. of thing. Cause like he grew up with them. He's obsessed, obsessed with the Beatles. I mean, mm-hmm. who, like who from that age isn't, mm-hmm. uh, how funny it must've been to be like a 20 year old, like rocking along to that. I mean, Paul McCartney wasn't that Rocky, you know, but apart from Rocky Raccoon, and, but <laughs> to, to, to listen to that. And then like they're past that age. And my dad's like approaching 70 now. And he says still like, I don't, I don't feel old yeah right you know? so i don't right. we look we think at our age you're 26 i'm 33 and i think we think at our age like gosh being 60 you must you, you must but i don't i don't think that ever happens no i don't think i'll feel that way when i'm 60 no. i think i'll feel like uh, i want a lot more i want many more years yeah the one crucial caveat would be do i have to watch everyone i love die or are, are they immortal too that's that robin williams film bicentennial man have you mm-hmm. seen that mm-hmm He's a he's a robot who looks suspiciously like Robin Robin Williams, you know, because mm-hmm. because it is him, mm-hmm. and he lives forever. And over the years, he keeps getting opera as the technology advances. It's a fantastic idea. It just wasn't well executed, which is why you've probably not seen it because it didn't mm-hmm. do that well years ago. It was, and it was Robin being very mawkish. He gets quite, you know, in those sometimes he's funny and silly, and sometimes mm-hmm. he's very mawkish, uh, like in Goodwill Hunting or something. So he was like that kind of uh, thing, and it was and it was I liked it. Mawkish. That's a word I've never heard. Uh, I'm scared I'm getting it wrong now, but I think Mawkish is like over the top, um, 
saccharin or like like oh, okay. when a movie is like come on like they're try they're putting the music on so that yeah. you he yeah. can be a bit mawkish sometimes so can Jim Carrey right mm -hmm. but, but but sometimes it's just right when mm -hmm. when they're reined in by a director yeah it's, it's just beautiful like in the the Truman Show mm -hmm. just if you, if the director tells Jim Carrey you know no no stay still just don't overdo everything he's great um, and so yeah he Robin what was my point oh yeah so over the years technology advances. And so he gets like a, a more human arm and then a more mm. human this and that. And eventually he's basically a human, but can still live forever. So he has all the thoughts and cares of a human. And his family, his original family, eventually died like 300 years previously, but he gets close to each member of the family. You know, he was sort of like a, the, the house robot. Mm -hmm. That was the thing. So he got close to them all and they all died. And it's such a fantastic and fascinating uh, concept. Yeah. And eventually he decides he wants to be human, even though he knows that will be... Uh, and it's not a spoiler because you're probably not going to watch it. So, okay. but it is otherwise. <laughs> otherwise it is. But he decides he wants to be human and has a real like heart. And he, you know, the next day slowly dies. Uh, you know, which is quite sad. Um, but yeah, he has to watch everyone he knew and loved die. So, would you say no then to it to living forever? It would give me a lot of pause. Yeah, because I don't know. You know, would I just grieve deeply? every time or would I learn to become mm. hardened enough not to grieve? Would I learn to not connect after a while? Mm. Or would I just get used to seeing, to, to living with people and watching them die and... Start to enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> Perverse pleasure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that would that would definitely give me pause. Yeah. That's... It's, it's, Li living in a world where just no one... No one around me is even within 200 years of the world that I grew up in. Mm -hmm. um, maybe if my brain were like neuroplastic enough to really just always be adapting and always feel like I'm of my world. Yeah. And I'm always up to date with how the dialect is changing. I don't sound like I'm from 200 years ago. I'm not crystallized in the time that I originally was a young man. Maybe then I would, but somehow somehow i worry that the human brain may not be built to last that long and yeah adapt forever yeah and so i may just feel like i'm out of place in the world and life might might not be worth living after a while i'd still take it though you still i'd, to love, find to live for, I'd love to live forever i don't mm -hmm. know well the thing is like i think we've developed loads of coping mechanisms for the fact that we know we're going to die and one of them is to lie about how much we would prefer to be yeah immortal right, right. people don't talk about that enough yeah that, that drives me mad all the bad guys in literature want to live forever yeah. and they're they're portrayed as greedy uh even like voldemort that's 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 the whole harry potter thing mm -hmm. right you into harry potter yeah, love it. Yeah, that's yeah. like the first book. And mm -hmm. you're supposed to read it like, what a greedy guy. But I'm reading it like, ah, oh, where's the stone? Yeah. I need this stone to live forever. And meanwhile, we're we're like often trying to extend our lives as much as physically yeah. possible. Yeah. While saying, while no, saying, I'll be all right. I but don't. I'd stop short of immortality, yeah. right? Yeah. Every Like loads of people I've asked have always said like, I think I'm just going to be ready to go. And I'm like... <laughs> Another question like <laughs> yeah. that, which I think is, I think is like too convenient is if you ask any man or woman whether they'd rather be a man or a woman, mm. they will almost always answer that they'd rather be what they are. What do you think that means? Well, it, it like can't be a true reflective answer on the question. It can't be that you've actually like objectively thought about it. If but, it, but it can't, you know, it, it's too much of a coincidence that everyone says, yes, I'd rather be exactly what I am. Or I, it'd be better to be exactly what I am. I think it's just because um, it's what you know, isn't it? Better the yeah, devil the devil you know. you know. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a weird one. I'd love to be a woman for a day. But if they answer that, then I would say that's an honest answer. I'd rather the devil. I actually don't. What you're saying is I actually don't know which is which is better to be. Yeah. But I'm going to stick with the devil I know. I think part of me is quite sort of quite um, it's quite an exciting idea to be a yeah. woman for the for a few hours. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe a few days. Yeah, maybe a few days. If I'm a a few days, you're risking <laughs> you're risking adjusting to it and actually, just yeah. a few days risks 
the per- wanting to be it permanently. And as a young woman, if you've only got a few days, you, yeah. those few days have to fall on the right time of the month, right? You don't, because if you've got those three days and it's your one time. And you're bloated the whole time. Oh man, the pain. Although at least then my fiance could be happy because it's like, I've experienced that. That's right. Because right? she goes around like punching me in the stomach for like right. three days every month. Right. She doesn't really do that. You've seen those videos where they hook up a yeah. guy to yeah, but a what simulated are they using? period. What is that? What's it doing? Is it punching them? Or? Uh, I think electric shocks or something. It's never going to be the same. No, it's never going to. I would love. I would love to experience the twenty six or so days of the month that aren't that the, right. those days. How right. long would you go? I'm a scientist. I can make Coleman Hughes a woman. And what what is the amount where I say where where you go? That's too long. I would say maybe four days is too long. So I'm giving you the chance of a lifetime. Three days. You is can too experience long. being the other sex. Yeah. And I'm going, but but it's got to be five days. Well. If those are the only two options, I think I probably would do it. <laughs> so we got to get onto onto trans stuff then, I guess. The reason trans stuff doesn't make sense to me, and that that's not me saying I, I don't you know respect and whatever empathize and all that stuff, is because I don't identify as as a sex. Mm-hmm. I just sort of am, and I do like a verb, mm-hmm. and I don't know how. Do you feel that way? I don't feel like I'm being I'm being man now. No, I think I disagree. I I think mm. I. I think because my biological sex and my self-concept align very Mm. neatly 99% of the time, I think I don't, there's nothing, there's no dissonance to notice. So it's easy to think that I don't have a self-concept of my gender. Right. But I think if you, if you forced me into a dress right now, I'd be extremely uncomfortable. And why would I be uncomfortable? It wouldn't be because... I just have some like general aesthetic dislike of dresses. I love dresses on women. It would be because my the image I projected is feminine and and suddenly the dissonance would be unignorable. I'd be I'd be crawling out of my skin wanting to get back into man clothes. But that's cultural, it's societal, it's not it's not inherent. And you'd get used to it. Uh no, I mean it's it's cultural, but it's also it's it's a fact that I do have a gender identity. I think you think you do. Okay, it's just very easy not to notice it when it's also in sync with how everyone else views you and with the genitals you have. Yeah, yeah, it's so hard because you might be right. It's like I have it and I don't realize I've got it, and that's what's hard for me to understand about people who who want to be the other. Well, you'd never notice it. It's like a fish in water, right? Mm. You never notice what's around you until you experience something different. Just so much of it. I mean, one trans person I spoke to, um, Debbie Hayton. Or if anyone, everyone just started calling me she all of a sudden, I think it would piss me off. I might. Note you to know? everyone, if you want to piss off Coleman, keep calling him she. But, but, but wouldn't that, what? You, that wouldn't bother you? Nah. Well, I just, I, again, it's beyond the realms of my very, very limited imagination. Mm-hmm. So I can't see a set of circumstances in which people start to say, what about her to me? And I'd be like, what? Yeah, it would shock me. But again, it's about a lot of it's about the perception of others. So this person, mm-hmm. Debbie Hayton, who is a physics professor who identifies as a woman, I believe. Uh, and, you know, and, and I sometimes do have a problem with it because it's like, you know, by growing hair longer and stuff like that. And it's like, well, is that what it means to be a woman, having long hair and things like that? And But then what she, because she wants to be she, it says about that is that... Um, it's about it's about the feeling of the perception of others. It's about how others view her. She wants mm-hmm. others. That's what it is for her. And I, I see. That was interesting to me. And I, obviously, mm-hmm. all trans people are going to feel things differently. But it was really <coughs> interesting to be like, oh, it's about how others view you. And then there's someone else. I can't remember her name now. Someone Bornstein, who used to be a Scientologist and, and is a trans person as well, um, who, who said she, she did loads for like um, trans rights and stuff. And then... Once she got to 70, she said, like, I don't really feel that anymore. Like, it's like, I'm still a she or whatever, but I'm not, I'm not that involved in my body. My, my boobs or whatever they are have sagged. Mm-hmm. I, I, I don't care about what my body looks like to other people. Mm-hmm. So I'm just doing and being. Mm-hmm. And that I related to that because I just felt like, okay, like I'm used to my genitals or whatever. But if it's just, I woke up one morning, like a Kafka-esque thing. And it's like, yeah. oh my God. Okay, it'd be a shock. Yeah. And then eh, get on with it, you know? Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, I wonder that there is an analogy to people that have um, this, what's the condition called where you don't think your arm is yours? Oh, yeah. Uh, I don't know what that's called. Ghost limb? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, like having a ghost limb. 
mean, there's been weird situations in life where just for me, for like a split second, you know, I, f- my right hand felt like my left and my left hand felt yeah. like my right. I've had these little, just little flashes of, yeah, of, of moments where certain strange things have happened where parts of my body don't feel correct. Mm-hmm. And I, my guess is that I don't know what causes that, but it's just a flash of what, if it were extended all day would become a kind of dysphoria, a deep dysphoria, not a gender dysphoria, but a literal, like, I don't think that my arm is mine. There's that thing, not to get crass, but when people talk about Mm self-love, there's that thing of like, people say, sit on your hand for a certain amount of time before doing so, because then it doesn't feel like it's your hand. Oh, but then you also (laughs) can't. Coleman looked at my hand when I said that. (laughs) I haven't done that. Remind me not to shake your hand after this. (laughs) I never did that, but I've heard people say that. Uh I've also heard people say, oh, use the other, your less used hand again for that same sensation. Because ultimately a lot of that self-love thing is about pretending that, especially when people are watching porn, Mm -hmm. is to pretend that they are the other. You are trying to almost be, have that dysphoria feeling that you are, you're, you're uh, living vicariously. By self love, you mean masturbation? Yeah, I was worried about the YouTube algorithm. But oh, you've said okay. it now, mate. <laughs> I just feel so weird calling that self love. What could you say that wouldn't like <laughs> kick off a, uh, a censorship thing on YouTube? Playing with yourself? I don't know. What yeah, that's, that's too like. Um, it's a uh, very British euphemism, tickling the general. <laughs> I'm in the UK. That's okay. strumming the guitar. Yeah. Yeah, that kind of thing. So there you go. Well, yeah, I mean. I'm trying to imagine if I actually woke up fully in the in the body of a female. Mm. I don't know. I mean, I think I would be super alarmed, but after a while, I would have to accept it. And I think, I mean, I think you know, you'd be you'd be surprised what you can adapt to. I think that's what I think. Yeah, I'd be too tall. I'd you'd be, be too, tall, be too be, tall. Yeah, that's my. There are women as tall as you. It so, wouldn't look good. Yeah, so I'm six foot four. You can't be a. Uh, no, you just made some women very angry. Oh no, no, but that they look beautiful. They oh, sh- sh- you're right. I'm actually worried about that. Maybe I'll take that bit out. Um, we should we need to wrap up because we've got like four minutes left. All right. Um, where do you want to send? Are we putting this out on each other's podcasts? Yes, we are. Where do you want to send my audience to go? So you can go to at Cold X Man on Twitter. You can check out my podcast conversations with Coleman, and you can go to ColemanHughes.org to become a subscriber. Fantastic. Uh, I will send your people to... Also, people should check out your rap stuff, man. Yeah. I, I'm not a rap person, mm-hmm. right? But my word, is it good? Thank you. Phenomenal. Thank you. I'm going to keep saying so until you feel... <laughs> you know what to say. It's ridiculously good. And the production, the video. So even if you're not a rap fan, the video is like worth watching. You know, you can't... So check out Blasphemy on YouTube. Blasphemy is the song. And I have an album coming out in early February called Amor Fati. So check that out on Spotify. So Apple good. Music, wherever you listen to music. So good, so good. And then my thing is On The Edge with Andrew Gold. We've interviewed many of the same people, Coleman and I, so there's a lot of the culture war stuff as mm-hmm. well. I'm not quite as philosophical as, or well-spoken as, as in fact, Sorry. I don't want to put people off. Yeah, come and, I am, I'm really good. Come and look, <laughs> look at the No, podcast. it's a great podcast. I love, I mean, there's so much, so many interesting people from the fringes of, of various you know, cults, former cult members, oh, yeah. former Scientology, um, just all of these very interesting, you know, people that you get. So, no, I, I think, you know, fans of me would probably be very interested in it. There'll be an overlap. Totally. My favorite episode was a guy who, um, in, he was in a plane crash <laughs> over the Andes mm-hmm. uh, from Uruguay to Chile and uh, had to eat his friends. That's my favorite ever episode wow. so that's it's only on the audio one so it's not on youtube you'd have to find it on the people will find it on spotify and all that but it's uh uh episode 53 and that blew my mind that one so there you go well on that note yeah thanks man thanks yeah. for coming on thanks for having me and cool. thank you for coming on thanks for having me <laughs> that's it for this episode of conversations with coleman guys as always thanks for watching and feel free to tell me what you think by reviewing the podcast commenting on social media, or sending me an email. To check out my other social media platforms, click the cards you see on screen. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.